was the only physical evidence they had. He was looking at it through the gun waiver I did because if I didn't, I probably would have shot him. Point blank right between the eyes. I hit point blank tell her. I think you did it, and she looks at me and says, prove it. The first person who confesses is usually the one that gets the best deal. Did he ever mention how much more money he was supposed to get? 30000 We know it was someone he knew. On a warm summer night in Florida, a man answers a knock at the door, steps outside, and is shot dead on his doorstep. The obvious suspect has a perfect alibi, but through investigative tenacity and a lucky break, police uncover a twisted plot that would lead to more than one person facing the death penalty. Holly Hill is kind of a bedroom community situated between Daytona Beach, which we are connected to on the south end, and Ormond Beach, which we are connected to on the north end. John Catania was a 45-year-old plumber. He'd been married to Karen Toby for about four years, had a two-year-old. Lynn Blake lived next door in the other duplex. She worked for John, and she also acted as the nanny babysitter of John Catanio's son. I think he was two years old at the time. She was very close friends with Karen Toby, John's wife. In fact, they did everything together. Phyllis Catanio was John's mother. His mother was staying with him at the time. His mother was in the house, and there was a knock on the door. Karen was asleep in the bedroom, and John was sitting in the living room. His mother went to the door, asked who it was. She couldn't really hear what the full name was. So she told Catania that there was somebody at the door for him. John went to the door, stepped outside, closed the door behind him. The next thing she heard were some pops. I said, what's that? He was shot. My son. I need to know where on his body he was shot. He's laying in the door, laying his blood everywhere, blood all around his head. Is he alive? I don't see it any movement. Well, I was called in from home. I arrived. Of course, we had police there already, and there was a body in front of a duplex. John Catanio had been shot four times. He'd been shot in the cheek, in the neck, again in the face, and there were bullet fragments that were found in his brain. So he died instantly when he was shot. There were bullet casings. That was the only physical evidence they had. They had no fingerprints, they had no DNA. So the neighbors don't hear a car coming, they don't hear gunshots, they don't hear the screeching of tires, they don't hear screams, they don't hear anything. That night, I made contact with Karen Toby, John's wife, with Lynn, with John's mother, and Lynn's duplex. Karen had been drinking. I could smell it on her breath, the way she was acting. When I told them that we were going to move them all down to the homicide investigation unit for interviews. She got put out, didn't really want to be bothered. And one of the things she said was, can't this wait till tomorrow? In my mind, the average wife would say, let's get to it. Let's find out who killed my husband. But she was willing to wait till the next day to talk about it. John's mother was actually in the house when he was killed as well. So there was proof that Karen wasn't the gunman. At that point in time, we didn't have a suspect or persons of interest. We know it was someone he knew, because when John opens the door, he goes ahead and just steps right out to talk to the guy like he knew who he was. During this investigation, we're trying to determine if any of these people have a motive. We find that there's a $500,000 life insurance policy that is less than two years old. He had a new baby and decided that he wanted to provide for his son in case of his death. Even though he got this life insurance policy for his son, 
Karen, as his wife, was the sole beneficiary. This was a flag showing a motive that Karen may have had. Karen, of course, was in the bedroom, so she couldn't have shot John. The mother was in the living room with John. Lynn was next door. This was when we started to press her and Lynn about this investigation. Karen, Toby, and Lynn Blake had a very codependent relationship. At times when I was watching them together, it appeared that Karen was in charge. At other times, in talking to people that had encounters with him, Lynn was in charge. Karen doesn't have a mother figure in her life, so Lynn is that mother figure and the grandmother figure, because there's this little boy named Lewis, the child of John and Karen, and Lynn loves this baby. Lynn used to drive Karen wherever she needed to go because Karen had a problem with alcohol and drugs. She was world class. She could go through a case of beer in a day, and she would do it day after day. She had a medication for her mental health problems, but I think she also was abusing some street drugs. But her main thing was drinking. Karen Toby was suffering from various substance use psychiatric and medical issues. She had hepatitis C, which is a virus that infects the liver. Drinking heavily on top of liver damage from hepatitis C, it's a good way to die young. Karen and Lynn show up at the Holly Hill Police Department and notify us that they're gonna go to Seattle. And that's where Karen is from. Her father lived in Seattle. Her sister lived out in Seattle. She went out there. We still didn't know who did the shooting. I get on a plane and I go to Seattle. I show up at Karen Toby's home and ask her if she would submit to a, an interview, particularly a lie detector test. During that attempted lie detector test, the first one, Karen actually admits to taking several different drugs and the lie detector operator says, this won't work. So we talked to Karen, please come back tomorrow. Let's try it again. Less drugs, please. The next day, she shows up. We do the lie detector. The operator indicates to me that she's trying to be deceptive. She refuses to let me interview her. I point blank tell her, I think you did it. And she looks at me and says, prove it. I said, I will prove it and I will see you in prison. In the shooting death of Florida plumber John Catania, police were looking at his wife, Karen Toby, and her best friend, Lynn Blake, as possible suspects. Karen Toby's actions seemed suspicious in the aftermath of the killing, but she had an ironclad alibi. Then, a month after the murder, a new suspect emerged. Ty John Cooper was working as a plumber's helper for John Catania. John gave him a job because he felt sorry for him because Ty John was just released from prison. Ty John got into a physical altercation with his girlfriend, Samantha Alexander. There was a call to Ormond Beach about a domestic dispute there at the house. Samantha did not want to press any charges, but she did say that Ty John is going to go to jail because he killed his boss man at Holly Hill or he had something to do with it. The officer called us and informed us of what was said up there and what had taken place. I get some gifts in this case. I get Tyjean Cooper beating up his girlfriend, and the girlfriend then after getting beat up and have her arm broke, she decides to tell on him. Well, we think you might have some information. Yes, my boyfriend, um, Cooper. Okay, I think they had something to do with, um, Thirty thousand. Thirty thousand. When was he supposed to get? 
um, for that event after it happened. This is now a murder for hire investigation now that we get this information from Taijan's girlfriend. I was like, um, oh, so you did do that. And he was like, um, and he held me down, he choked me. I couldn't, I had to stop working. He fractured, well, broke my wrist and he threatened to kill me. She gave us enough where we verified that she had a broken wrist. Taijan was on parole at the time, and we had Taijan arrested for the domestic violence. So police go through phone records when they're investigating a crime, and that's how they, they can often draw the lines between people. During this investigation, we received some information from Taijan Cooper's phone records and we had interviewed the woman who owned one of the phones that was in contact with him. And during this interview, during one of her phone conversations, uh, she hears some loud bangs. She asked him what the noise was. And Taijan said, oh, don't worry about it. I'm just testing my gun. She said, testing your gun? Where are you? He said, in my backyard. Based on that, I write up a search warrant, and we go to Taijan Cooper's home and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement's crime scene people process the house, and we find a spent shell casing and a spent round in a flower pot. We collected the cartridge case and sent it to the crime lab. That cartridge case matched one of the cartridge cases found at the murder scene. It definitively connected Taijan to the scene where John Catanio had been killed. Taijan's in big trouble. Lynn was on Karen's case about running her mouth to other people about things that have been going on. Karen would be drinking and lose control of what she was saying sometimes. As this case unfolds, you can see where Karen is stepping away from Lynn. That's when I started using that to my benefit to drive a bigger wedge between them because I knew that the two were involved and I needed one of them to give me the evidence I needed in this case and I knew that Lynn was the one. The problem when there's a bunch of people who are committing a crime together is that they can't always keep their stories straight and somebody is going to talk. Who was going to kill John with a gun? I guess Karen was. I wasn't going to. <laughs> In the shooting death of John Catanio, detectives were convinced they had uncovered a murder-for-hire conspiracy involving three suspects. The problem was they couldn't prove it in a court of law, and none of the conspirators were talking. Detectives needed one of the suspects to crack and turn state's evidence against the others. Sean and I were interviewing Lynn Blake and basically told her, we know you're involved in all this. The truth is we do have a black guy in jail and we have seized a bullet shell casing mm -hmm. that is at the lab. We may make a deal with that guy. That's fine. You might have a problem. I'm thinking that you're right now sitting here lying to protect Karen, knowing full yeah. well, and we, that's probably going to be enough for accessory after the fact. You know, 20, 30 years is going to be a life sentence, isn't it? Yeah. We tell her, basically, the first person who comes in and confesses and tells the truth is usually the one that gets the best deal. They really didn't phase Lynn. Karen has an attorney. He called us and told us to look at you. <laughs> I don't know what for. You don't know what for? No. This well, is hilarious. Well, I know I had nothing to do with this. No? Well, no. You don't know anything? God struck me dead right where I'm sitting. I don't know. Sean showed her the Florida statute book about accessories and how they could be charged. Read this. Take that home. Might be good for you to read later. It's about accessories and principles and things like that with the law. She calls me the next day, and I bring her down for an interview, and she gives it up. I was starting last February, back home stay. John just blew her off. He said, you don't deserve a Valentine's Day card. And at that point, Karen was clean and sober. But he said, by the way, I'm taking a and we're, we're going. 
We're going to go to New York and live. That was when Karen and I both started asking around to get again. According to Lynn, there was a family reunion that was going to occur in Georgia. And it was her belief and Karen's belief that this reunion was going to be a point in time where John was going to take the baby away from her and at that same time have her committed for her drinking and drugs. So it was, this was the impetus for, for killing John. Tajan was at their house several times. Lynn said that Karen approached Tajan about getting a gun. She was talking with, with Ty, so she asked him, can you get me a gun? And he said, what for? And she told him why. And she told him to kill my husband? I don't know if she said those words. I think she said, well, my husband's trying to take my son from me. Okay. And I've got to stop him. They had met Taijan out at the mall, and he provided them with a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. An envelope was passed, and there was like $2,700 in the envelope. When he handed her the gun, I handed him the money. Let me make sure I understand this right. Originally, the plan was he was going to get you a gun. Who was going to kill John with a gun? I guess Karen was. I wasn't going to. They then take the gun. They go try to shoot it and it jams every time they shoot the gun. So they decided to get rid of it, and they took it to Mocha Park and threw it into one of the canals there. We didn't find the gun. They went and told Taijan the gun didn't work, and they needed it done immediately because they were going to leave for this family reunion. And Taijan said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. When was it decided how much you were going to get paid for actually shooting John? She, she just told him I'll give you five grand. It got to where it was getting closer and closer to July. And we were panicking because we knew that when they got up in the mountains of Georgia, Lewis was not coming back. And Karen talked to Ty again, and he said he could, he could take care of it. And we told him it had to be done before July the 1st. Ty John said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And next thing you know, John's dead at the front door. According to family members, there was no plans to steal the baby away. This family reunion, I, I believe, was a concoction by Karen to help motivate Lynn to do what, what they needed done, because Lynn loves this baby. And this baby was going to be gone, and Lynn wasn't going to be in the baby's life anymore. This was an enhanced premeditation, as, as most hired murders are. And the motivation, of course, for, for the two was financial. She, of course, had the insurance money that was going to become available if she got away with this. And Cooper, the trigger man, did it for money as a state attorney. I looked at the facts and circumstances of the case and just determined whether or not, under the law, the death penalty would be appropriate. The overall strategy was Toby's defense would have been to try to save her life. If we got something less than first degree murder, well, that's the icing on the cake. I probably should have shot him point blank right between the eyes. Lynn Blake, the state's key witness, is a murderer. Karen Toby and Ty Jean Cooper were on trial for their lives, accused of being part of a murder for hire conspiracy that left John Catanio dead. A third conspirator, Lynn Blake, turned state's evidence and was set to become the prosecution's star witness. But was Lynn Blake actually the mastermind and the shooter? That's what not one, but two defense teams were about to argue. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have been selected and sworn as the jury to try the cases of State of Florida versus Tajon Cooper and State of Florida versus Karen Toby. The advantage for the defense is trying the case with more than one person on trial is the other defense attorneys also battling the state at the same time. So Mr. Cooper had his defense team, Karen Toby had her defense team, and so the two of you can kind of tag team the state. 
Are we ready to proceed with uh, opening statements? Yes, Your Honor. Morning. This defendant, Karen Toby, hired this defendant, Ty John Cooper, to murder her husband so she could get her husband out of her life and collect $500,000 of life insurance money. Our defense is to blame Lynn Blake for the crime that she basically used Karen as a dupe. Lynn Blake, she pled guilty to second degree murder. She had a plan. I will submit to you, there is evidence to prove that Lynn Blake controlled this thing. You are gonna hear testimony that she was the mastermind of this plan. Mr. Cooper's defense was that, same as ours, that Lynn Blake was the one responsible for the murder. On behalf of Taishwan Cooper, our position is that Lynn Blake walked out of her door in a duplex, walked to the next door, which is not much longer than this jury box, had John Catanio summoned to the door and shot and killed John Catanio. Lynn Blake, the state's key witness, is a murderess. Lynn Blake was the star witness, so she was telling everything that she knew, but this was part of her deal with prosecutors. So to the prosecution, Lynn Blake's testimony drew the line from Karen to Taijan. At any point, did you hear a discussion between Ms. Toby and Mr. Cooper about uh, the price or how much she would pay him for killing her husband? Yes, sir. $5,000. Did she tell him where she would get the money from? She said that she would pay him out of the money that she would get from the insurance money. Mr. Cooper had a different situation to defend because he was the alleged shooter. Karen was just the alleged planner. But as far as the general concept, the two defense teams were pointing the finger at Ms. Lynn Blake. You and Karen had talked a lot about When's this going to happen? Yes, sir. You talked to us about July the 1st being an important date, right? Yes, sir. July the 1st being the important date because that's when Lewis was going to be taken away. Right? Yes, sir. You weren't going to stand for that, were you? No, sir. No way in the world are you going to let anybody take baby mm -hmm. Louie from you. Not if I can do anything about it, no. So Taijan's lawyers said he wasn't the trigger man. It was actually Lynn Blake. And in fact, many times when you had that gun, when you admit to having the gun, you were afraid that you even say it, that you were gonna go over and shoot John Catanio right between his eyes. Oh no, sir, I never said it like that. No. Now you're, 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 you're misstating my, my remarks. And when he started beating up on her, it was a good thing I threw the gun away where I did because if I didn't, I, would, I probably would have shot him point blank right between the eyes. I just, I just got to the point where I said, no, I have to get rid of this gun because if I don't, I'm going to kill John myself. Lynn indicated that John was abusive to Karen, but during my interviews with family and friends and other people, the abuse was, was Karen against John. John was the kind of guy that would take a slap and a push and, and everything else and never react. I am very averse to men being on women. You will not stand for that, will you? No, I will not. And you will not also stand for anybody taking baby Louie from you? No, I won't. Not any of the Catanio family? Oh, no, I, I'm perfectly happy with them being him. Being I understand him. that, but you wouldn't allow any of them to take baby Not, in, not in the way that it was going to be done, no. She was cross-examined, not once, but twice. Once by Ty John's lawyers and once by Karen's lawyers. You controlled her. No, I have never controlled Karen. You used to store alcohol at your apartment no, she would go buy it and bring it to my house so that John would not find it. Okay, and you'd let her drink there, right? Yes, I did. You'd keep feeding it to her, wouldn't no, you? I, no, I did not feed it to her. So the question is, to what extent was Karen Toby the scheming mastermind here versus a confused, drunken, psychiatrically ill victim of circumstances? Karen is an alcoholic. I would limit her to so much, period. John would buy her a 12-pack a day. But to that, Karen, that wasn't enough for Karen. 
Karen had to have more than 12 pack a day. She would go up to the corner and get her own beer and stash it at my house. It's in your best interest to keep her under the influence, isn't it? No, sir. Isn't it the truth that you were the one to mastermind of this whole deal? No, sir. Karen was in a very bad state at the time, barely functional, reliant on her neighbor and co-defendant, Lynn Blake, to do many things for her. You don't think it would have been a caring thing to do to say, John, your wife's got a crazy idea, if in fact that's true? No, at the time, it, 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 didn't, it didn't, didn't even, even dawn on me to tell John. You don't think it would be proper to it, tell it somebody might, that his life might be in danger? It might have been proper, but, but my, at, at that point, my concern was for Karen and for Lewis. How could you say your concern is for Karen when you're saying that she might be committing a murder? That's your definition of caring? Well, obviously it is. You don't, you don't care at all about her. The only uh, thing no. you cared about was Lewis. In fact, you still have plans when you get out of here. You think you're going to get out of jail and get Louie back, don't you? No, sir. Ma'am, can you state your name? Shandella Michelle Gates. Okay. And Ms. Gates, uh, where are you currently being housed? At Volusia County Jail. Ms. Gates was important to Karen Toby's defense because she was able to have Lynn Blake confide in her when they were in jail together. Did she ever talk to you about her entering into a plea agreement? No, she just told me she was getting probation and she was gonna get out and um, get, get, little, get Karen's son and leave. That would be Lewis? Yes, sir. She said she was his legal godmother <coughs> and she was gonna go and get him because she's getting out on probation. Lynn had confided in her that she would get out little or no time, and then Karen would be in, Mr. Cantanio's dead, and now she's got baby Lewis. Mr. Cooper, did you shoot John Cantanio? No, sir. Karen Toby and Tyjon Cooper were on trial for a murder for hire conspiracy that left John Catania dead. Both defendants had a right to testify in their own defense, which is always a high wire act in a capital murder case. One defendant declined to testify. The other dared to take the stand. I need to advise each client on the record as to their right to testify or not testify. And Ms. Toby, you have the right to testify in your case if you wish to do so. Do you understand that? Yes. Karen was a loose cannon. We didn't know what could happen on the stand. Plus, we're constantly thinking in our mind about the second phase. If we put her up there during her own defense and the jury thinks she's lying, catches her in one big material lie, it's a chance they're gonna hold it against her later. And so we tried to keep her off. Plus, the truth of the matter is, Karen Toby did not want to testify. She was afraid. Your Honor, this time the defense will call Taishwan Cooper to the stand. Tom Mott made that decision that every defense lawyer has to make in every case, that I would guess that, well, what have you got to lose? Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, how you doing? Could you please tell the juror your name? My name's Tyjon Cooper. Was there ever a time when Lynn Blake or Karen Toby approached you about a gun? Yes, sir, it was. Tell the jury about that. Me and Ms. Toby ended up in the backyard by ourselves. It came up like, do you know where I can get a gun? What was the reason? She was like, well, there's a lot of robberies have been going on in the neighborhood, and she was scared to be home by herself with a little kid because John would be on the road with us. What, and what, what was your response to that? No, I just shook my head, and she, she asked me, uh, you know people in the hood, don't you? Like, I guess all black people know people in the hood. And uh, I said, yeah, I know people in the hood. She said, see if you can score something down there for me. How did I it mean, come to pass that you got them a gun? It was this one day I was getting in my car and uh, they roll up and Miss Blake, she goes, uh, Ty, you gonna get it yet? Or have you gotten it yet? And I say, no, nah, I ain't got it yet. She said, what's taking you so long? And that's when Miss Toby interrupted and said, well, we got $3,000 waiting on you. So my mom was like, $3,000? 
I say, look, meet me at the shop tomorrow after work. Okay, and so, so I went up. I went up to a little spot, and, and I got one. The next day, I brought it to work with me. And um, Miss Blake pulled up in a white SUV. And I said, I got it. What's up? And she told me, Oh no, not here or well, not now. Meet me at the mall behind Sears an hour. I was who, like, okay. Who told you that? Miss Blake. Was Miss Toby with her? No. Did you suspect that this gun was going to be used for a murder? <clears throat> no. Did you think that there was anything? sinister that was going to happen other than that these ladies or Lynn Blake in particular was going to use this to for a protection station no offense there's two white ladies in the, in the suburbs of Holly Hill I didn't I didn't think nothing like that he pointed the finger at Karen but he mainly pointed it at Miss Blake did you hear anything further about a gun not for about two weeks and so on my way back to the truck I see Miss Blake she goes come here come here basically we, we paid three thousand dollars for a piece of what do you mean by that? I guess the gun didn't work. And then what happened? That weekend, I went back up to the little place. He gave me another gun. Oh, he gave me some bullets also. Uh, I took it, put it in my car, I went back home. And I went to my backyard. I loaded the gun up. I sat down on a little lawn chair that we have back there. And I took a shot. I took a shot at a little flower pot. So at least now I know this works. Did you hear anything more from Lynn Blake? Yeah, later on that afternoon, I mean, she came by. And what happened? She got the gun from me. Okay. And she said, does this one work? I was like, yeah, it worked. I tested it myself. Okay. Did you shoot John Catania? No, sir. Did you conspire with Lynn Blake? Or tell this jury if you conspired with Lynn Blake or Karen Toby to shoot John Catania? No, sir. I have no further questions. So, Mr. Cooper, if I get this straight now, what you're telling us here is you got a gun and you sold a gun to Lynn Blake and Karen Toby. Yes, sir. Is that right? And you went to Lucia Mall and received $2,700 for a gun. Yes, sir. And you'd agree that $2,700 is a pretty stiff price for a little 22, wouldn't you? Right. How much you pay for the gun? 45, 50 bucks. But, but you must know that some, something's up there. I mean, if, if you're three thousand dollars for a gun in your mind, right? You must know something's over, over. You must know something's up here, Mr. Cooper. Three thousand dollars for for forty five dollar twenty two. I mean, in your mind, you you must know something's up, correct? No, I, I don't know anything. I just three thousand dollars. Okay. Davis, would you care to, to uh, address the jury? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. John Catanio is not here with us today. He was murdered in cold blood on his doorstep due to the actions of three people. Karen Toby, Ty John Cooper, and Lynn Blake. Two of those, Karen Toby and Lynn Blake, solicited Ty John Cooper to murder John Catanio. All three of them conspired together with each other, discussed it on numerous occasions, conspired to murder John Catanio. And then on the evening of June 30th of 2004, Ty John Cooper gunned Mr. Catanio down on his doorstep. I'm asking you to return a verdict of guilty as charged in this case. Thank you. Lynn Blake had a motive, and her motive was to get that baby. Now, the only way she can get the baby, and she doesn't deny it, is to get rid of two people, Mr. Cantanio, we know how she did that. She hired Mr. Cooper to kill him. Now she's got to get rid of Karen. How does she do it? She's going to go to the police and set her up and accuse her of planning it and being involved. Her plan went all wrong when the state and the police decided to link her into it. But that was her plan. Get the baby by eliminating John and eliminating Karen. Karen Toby was not mentally capable of forming the intent to get involved in this conspiracy. 
She was drunk constantly and high on pills. We're asking that you turn verdicts of not guilty. Well, who shot John Catania? The state wants you to assume that since that gun was in Ty Cooper's backyard three or four weeks before the shooting, that he therefore shot John Catania. That is speculation, it is conjecture, and it is hunches, and it is far from proof beyond a reasonable doubt. What about somebody seeing Ty Cooper coming and going from that residence? Nobody did. You know why? Because Lynn Blake did it. All she had to do was take four or five steps and she's there. And she goes, pow, pow, pow. Then she goes right back in her house. Lynn Blake shot John Catania because she was going to lose baby Lewis. She wouldn't stand for it. Ty Cooper is not guilty. It's my understanding that the jury has reached a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Karen Toby, as follows. After 17 hours of deliberation, the jury in the capital murder trials of Karen Toby and Tyjon Cooper had reached a verdict. Would the defendants be found guilty? And if so, would they be sentenced to death? We have verdicts in two case numbers. Madam Clerk, will you publish the verdict in each case? Yes, sir. State of Florida versus Karen Toby. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Karen Toby, as follows. Count three, guilty of first degree murder as charged in the indictment. Count four, guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder as charged. Count five, guilty of solicitation to commit first degree murder as charged. State of Florida versus Tyshawn Verdell Cooper. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Taishwan Verdell Cooper, as follows. Count one, guilty of manslaughter without a firearm, a lesser included offense. Count two, guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder as charged in the indictment. So Cooper was actually convicted of a lesser charge, which was manslaughter without a firearm, which kind of leads us to believe that the jury thought maybe he wasn't the trigger man after all. He was involved with it, but didn't pull the trigger. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have found the defendant Karen Toby guilty of murder in the first degree. The punishment for this crime is either death or life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Final decision as to what punishment shall be imposed rests solely with the judge of this court. However, the law requires that you, the jury, render to the court an advisory sentence as to what punishment should be imposed upon the defendant. The state attorney's office, they go first, and they present to the jury what's called aggravating circumstances. On the day that, that he's murdered, she's standing with a camera, looking through the camera lens at her husband and child and Mr. Cano's mother, and that's cold blood. And after taking this picture of her smiling husband with her son, this is what happened hours later. Based on the aggravating circumstance, the cold calculated method this was carried out and the financial gain expected, what does she deserve under the law? And there is only one answer in the law, and that is clearly this defendant deserves the death penalty. For the defense, your sole job is to try to get the jury to give her life instead of the death penalty. And then in her case, she had a lot of what's called mitigation because of her mental health condition and the abuse that she had been through. Looking at her history, it was ominous that she's drinking at the age of eight, drinking heavily and smoking marijuana regularly by the age of 12 or 13. When you see somebody starting that young, then the risk is progression to even more intense drugs. This is someone who by the age of 15 told me he was using intravenous heroin. By the age of 15, she was a junkie. 
this is not a good thing for a still developing brain. I was trying to show, look at this person's life arc, humanizing her for the jury, and then reasons how she got to be in such a situation. At 29, Karen was in an abusive relationship. She received a skull fracture, continued to hear voices, and suffered from depression. She had a hospitalization in Pennsylvania where they diagnosed her as a major depressive disorder recurrent and alcohol abuse, as well as at least four prior suicide attempts. We showed her to be a very flawed individual with a history of severe difficulties beginning very early in her life, a tragic life arc, and a reason to spare her from the needle. Has the jury reached a determination on the recommendation? Yes, we have, Your Honor. Madam Clerk, will you publish the verdict, please? Okay. State of Florida versus Karen Toby. Penalty phase advisory sentence. The jury advises and recommends to the court that it impose a sentence of life imprisonment upon Karen Toby without the possibility of parole. For the defense, the life sentence with no parole is a huge win. She was relieved, you know, she smiled and she hugged us and, you know, but she also was hit with the reality that she knew she was going to spend every rest of her day locked up in a cage. Karen and Tajon Cooper both received life. And no, I was not satisfied with that outcome. When you kill someone for money, I mean, that just shows you how depraved you really are. Like we told Lynn, the first person that comes clean is usually the one that gets the best deal. And Lynn actually got the best deal out of it. In my opinion, Lynn Blake definitely got away with murder to the degree that she didn't have the longer sentence. Just one other matter, and then we're doing that. I feel sad for Mr. Cantanio. You know, he was truly an innocent victim. The motive was greed and control. The guy didn't do anything to anyone. So I feel bad for that. And I do feel good about the fact that we avoided the death penalty for Karen. Prison may have saved her life and extended her lifespan. Using Heavy amounts of alcohol with hepatitis C is a good way to die of liver failure. So given her lifestyle, her medical problems, she will probably live substantially longer in the sober environment where she receives medical care in a prison. So perhaps that is an irony that she will live longer. Karen Toby is now in a Washington state prison, transferred there to be closer to her family. Tyjon Cooper remains in a Florida prison. Lynn Blake served her seven and a half years in prison and was released in 2011. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew.